everyone and welcome back to my channel. In today's video we're going to be taking a look at all of the orchids that we have in bloom for the month of January and we're going to start off with the stunning orchid that we've got in front of us. So this might be quite long because I'm going to include some other orchids that maybe I wouldn't have included in previous videos based on some feedback um, just to show you guys kind of everything that's in bloom all in one video and we're starting off here with one that I actually repotted with you guys which I'll link up in the corner and down below and this is the Cattleya guatemalensis. This is a naturally occurring primary hybrid between Guaranthi aurantiaca and Cattleya skinneri. Now I wanted to film this now because it is aging and when it, they first opened, it's only been open about a week, but they were a lot more orange and they've kind of faded to this kind of watermelony colour. It really reminds me of watermelon in terms of colour. It's very peachy, pinky, um, but with hints of orange. And then the lip is a really beautiful dark pink, fringed with a slightly peachy brownie colour. And then it fades into a peachy orange before you have this dark speckling, which is a beautiful contrast. It produces clusters of flowers, so this takes after the, the Guaranthe parent in this. There is no detectable fragrance, but the clusters of gorgeous pink flowers really do make up for this in this stunning hybrid. Now, it is quite a large Cattleya. When I got it, um, the seller had notified me that it had sunburn on the leaves. It had a new growth, which had a sheath. The sheath then actually dried up and Buds began forming maybe a month after the sheath had dried. When I first got it, uh, I put it straight under the Mars LED grow lights to give it the best chance possible of that sheath flowering. And it definitely seems to have paid off because we have a really beautiful flower display. I'm not sure how long these are gonna last, whether the initial color fade means they won't last as long or whether the initial color fade happens and then they still last kind of a normal Cattleya flowering time. Just look at the flowers though, they're so stunning and that contrast in the lip is just absolutely gorgeous. So that is the Cattleya guatemalensis, super easy grower. It had already formed roots from the new growth when I got it, but that hasn't stopped it from producing even more new roots from that newest growth where it obviously has available nodes for root production. It's adapted really well to semi-hydro and inorganic media in general, so I think that it's a really good candidate for semi-hydro and just a super easy, super rewarding grower. So that's the Cattleya guatemalensis. Next up we have the beautiful Cycnodes Jumbo Puff. Now this is an absolutely stunning, waxy, yellow flowered Catacitinae type orchid, which produces these beautiful, long lasting waxy blooms. These actually lasted about a month, which is very good for uh, Catacitinae types, although I don't have much experience with Cycnoches or Cycnodes. And um, Cycnodes is a primary hybrid between uh, Mormodes and Cycnoches, just has those species in its parentage. I'll pop the species composition for the Jumbo Puff up on screen. Absolutely adore these flowers. And unfortunately, I'm filming under my grow light because the display is so huge and I don't want to knock them around and damage them trying to get them out at this point. And um, when they were just buds, I could with one flower, but I'm going to just film under the grow light because it gives a fairly accurate representation of color. They are slightly cooler toned under this grow light. So in reality, they're more kind of a buttery, warm, waxy yellow, but you can still get the idea. The fragrance on this is incredible. It's like being punched in the face with a foam banana sweet. It's uh, very, very intense, very strong, and very like artificially banana. It's lovely from a distance because I like fake banana smells, but unfortunately, if you go and sniff it up close, um, you'll probably recoil a little bit. It's that strong, and that's quite common with Catacitinae types. So this is a Sick Nodes Jumbo Puff, and I would highly recommend it if you love banana fragrances. It's a beautiful, beautiful orchid, long-lasting flowers. I'm quite new to Catacitinae type, so I'm still kind of learning. I only got this last year, and I'm surprised that it's flowered for me. But as you can see, it's a beautiful display. Next up, we have my Rinka Stylus Gigantias, Spots and Red Varieties. The one I'm showing you here is the Spots variety, and I will show you the Red variety in a second. I have done videos on 
all three of my Rinka Stylist Gigantias and I recently collected them into one video which I will link in the top right and down below. So that was a video mainly looking at their blooms. I do have another one on their care. So I'm just going to briefly mention these and show you for the sake of completeness uh, what I've had in bloom for January. So uh, these are stunning, stunning orchids. Rinka Stylist Gigantias are one of my favourites. This one is the red variety, the previous one was the spots variety. They both have extremely strong fragrances, which I'm not the biggest fan of. Um, I'm sure you probably, if you have seen my other videos, have heard me talk about this quite a lot, but the smell kind of reminds me of um, lemon citrusy artificial fragrance with a spicy edge and kind of a very unpleasant back note, which someone did describe as like fermented um, like old lemon juice. I kind of get that um, description. For me, I would probably describe it as having notes of cat pee. And, you know, that's just my honest opinion of what I detect. But I think that that musky note is something that's very um, dependent on individuals as whether well you have that kind of nose makeup. Um, in your genetics that can detect that or not because some people love that fragrance so just bear that in mind some people love this and you might be one of them I'm not one of them but I love their flowers so I keep them regardless so these are the Rinka Stylish Gigantias next up we've got the Vanda Cherry Blossom, which is previously Asco Phoenicia. Obviously, Neo Phoenicia has been reclassified to Vanda, and I think Asco Centrum has been reclassified to Vanda. So it's now Vanda Cherry Blossom, although I do think that the old names do give us a bit more cultural information because this little guy loves moisture. It's a primary hybrid between Neo Phoenicia Falcata and Asco Centrum Ampelaceum. It's got three spikes currently. It's potted in a semi hydro mix with pumice and leca and it is just thriving. It gets a lot of anthocyanins on the leaves, which to start with did concern me, but it's otherwise very healthy, and I think it is just very prone to anthocyanins. Unfortunately, I don't detect any fragrance with this beautiful orchid, but it's super compact. It could fit easily on any grower's shelf, and look at this beautiful, vibrant display. It's just been such an easy grower and bloomer for me, so, Based on that, I would recommend it to anyone, and I would think this one's easier than the actual Neophoenicia species, to be honest. It was the first of my Neophoenicia Ascocentrum type hybrids to bloom. I've got a couple of uh, other Neophoenicia hybrids, that Neostylus Lucineri and a Renanthera Neophoenicia hybrid that are ready to bloom, but this was the first to start spiking. Just look at the display beautiful, vibrant pink, tinged with a kind of orangey yellow on the nectar spur which does make it look like the flowers are fading a little and it concerned me just when they first opened but it is just what they look like the most beautiful tiny tiny delicate little flowers that i think i've ever seen i'm just in love with it i love this little yellow kind of center that it has as well it makes it so much more intricate so that is the vanda cherry blossom Next up we have the amazing Phragmopedium lindenii. This is an absolutely stunning Phragmopedium and it's one of the few if only slipper orchids that actually doesn't have a slipper. Now this is said in some uh, instances to be a very similar orchid or a synonym to Phragmopedium cordatum. Now I'm not sure if that's the case, I'm very new to Phragmopediums. I was stunned when this one came for sale. Um, just by the appearance of the flowers and I had to get it. It wasn't the cheapest Phragmopedium, it cost me around £30 um, and as a newbie to Phragmopediums that kind of seemed like a lot but actually having looked around for the size of plant that I got I think it was very reasonable. I got this um, last September I think and it initially seemed to struggle for a little while with me. I repotted it into a mix of ceramis, um, pumice and leca because it, from what I've read, it's a cool growing high altitude um, Phragmopedium that's constantly moist in nature. So I thought that that would be quite a good mix for it. It seemed to stall for a little bit. It didn't have many roots at all when I got it. Um, and then recently it put out a flower spike. Um, the sheath kind of developed in the center of the plant as with most Phragmopediums and Paphiopedilums. And then it produced three buds. 
This isn't unusual for this Phragmopedium. I think it can often produce several buds per display. One thing that's really unique about this is that instead of having a, a pouch for its lip, I guess, um, it has basically a modified petal. So it's almost kind of a reverse Peloria, I guess. I'm really happy with the result of the one that I've got because it's got kind of red edging to the petals and lip. I'm getting quite confused with calling these petals, but they, they are petals and they are extremely long trailing and produce this absolutely gorgeous effect. I posted a picture on my community tab when this first opened because it reminded me of a squid when it was just starting to open. Um, one out of three buds at the moment is open. You can see that it's got this kind of hair-like fringing inside the flower, which is really interesting, which you can't really detect unless you look closely. So it's really, really intricate and interesting. I'm going to make a full video once this guy fully opens up, but that is the Phragmopedium lindenii. Next up we have the Paphiopedalum Delanati, which is one of the few reportedly fragrant Paphiopedalums. Now this is the Delanati that I got from Spice Sotic. I also got one from Rolk Orchidine, which has since bloomed for me. Unfortunately, the one from Rolk bloomed and it had this brown spotting on the sepal. And so I didn't record it because I thought, oh, I've maybe got water on it at some point. I've ruined this display. And then the one from Spisotic decided to rebloom. And unfortunately, the same things happened. And I figured out why. It's because it's too close to my grow lights. And these flowers are very susceptible to burning, apparently. You can tell that this has happened because it's happened only on the portion of the bud that would have been exposed to the light directly um, for long periods of time, which is the, obviously, the sepal the dorsal sepal has kind of protected the bud if you think about the way the bud would have formed and it's also been exposed to the burning so i moved this away from the grow light won't happen again this one from spisotic is super interesting because it consistently blooms with two buds now the one from Rolk just bloomed with one bud and I think I've just mainly seen them with one bud before. So it's really interesting that I've got one that just consistently reblooms with two buds because it had two buds when I got it, which has since faded. And these two buds have opened up and have a wonderful, wonderful fragrance of raspberry, but like soft, creamy raspberry. I would describe this more as like a raspberry yogurt type of fragrance than crushed raspberries which would be more kind of strong and sharp and sweet and this one's more of a soft creamy raspberry kind of fragrance it's not strong but it definitely when you get close to it you can detect it which is lovely and of course it's got these absolutely stunning mottled leaves and you would probably be happy to get this as a foliage plant alone absolutely beautiful the veining and mottling on it is almost iridescent this one is planted in a mix of Predominantly ceramis with a little bit of pumice and lecca and a top layer of horticultural grit and the root growth has been really good actually, I'm really happy with it. I'm seeing lots of new root tips emerging and the actual plant seems to be producing new fans. So I'm really happy overall with this plant and how it's doing. So that is the Paphiopedalum delanati. Next, I'm just going to take you on a quick tour of my Phalaenopsis top shelves with the fowls I can't move easily into my separate filming zone. So we're in the grow room and we're going to take a look at some of my fowls. First one is this beautiful kind of lavender coloured Phalaenopsis which has produced a wonderful cascade of flowers. This is a no ID um, garden centre, I think I got it from Ikea actually, hybrid and it's produced a one branch plus there's a secondary branch starting huge pink flowers I absolutely love. Next up we've got uh, one of my first Phalaenopsis I ever got actually which is like a Harlequin type Phalaenopsis. The spotting on the first flowers is actually more intense than the spotting on the secondary flowers but I love it regardless and it's produced a beautiful cascade. Next we have one that looks very similar to the Phalaenopsis Bolden's Kaleidoscope um, but there is a few that are very similar hybrids and I have another which is also a very similar hybrid here and this is, who knows, Bolden's Kaleidoscope, something similar. There's three that look nearly identical and I can't remember the other two. Um, yeah, I can't really tell but either way they're beautiful. Next we have my white Phalaenopsis hybrid which has produced two spikes and one with a secondary branch. 
And my Peloric Phalaenopsis is up here, which isn't my favourite. But regardless of whether you like this kind of Peloria or not, it's still a very pretty orchid and it's grown very well for me. I've got another white Phalaenopsis here, um, which has produced much bigger flowers, but fewer. Very pale yellow, smaller flowered Phalaenopsis. Um, as you can see, we've got loads and loads of root growth on this. They haven't been repotted for a little while. Next, we've got my Phalaenopsis Sweet Memory Leodoro, which I could move. It's not like a top, top shelf, really heavy one, but the flower spike is about 120 centimeters long. Um, I've had to stake it kind of to the shelf, so that's not coming out again. It's got a wonderful kind of citrusy fragrance that's not particularly strong, but I do really enjoy. It's definitely a bonus with the Leodoro. I do apologize for the grow light, um, but as I said, I can't actually move this one anymore for now. And it's also working on another spike at the same time. So that's the Sweet Memory Leodoro. Next we have the Phalaenopsis Bellina Alba crossed with Tetraspis C1, which is part of my seedling um, Phalaenopsis project. I got three of these as seedlings to look at the variation, and this is the first one that I got actually, which is now in bloom. Um, it was very, very small when it arrived, but it's now got some roots and nice spike. I think it's got another spike starting at the moment. So the main difference I can notice on this is the colour shading on the sepals. So we've got kind of a gradient effect shading, which we didn't have on the first one. It's got like a wonderful citrusy fragrance as well. I'm going to put a comparison up on screen of the first bloom of one of the bigger plants that I got and this seedling and you can see the differences. Next we've got another no ID mini Phalaenopsis and this is one that was involved in the semi-hydro versus bark moss mix project. This is the semi-hydro one which produced the spike first. I absolutely love this hybrid, I don't know what hybrid it is. It's very very vigorous, it's done very well in semi-hydro, it's also done well in bark and moss so it's a very versatile hybrid and it's got this wonderful kind of white streak on the underside of the lip which I actually love. I feel like it's a really interesting contrast along with its little white nose and I'm an absolute sucker for any kind of pink, peach, orange hybrid of colours. Um, they're my favourite colour palette. Speaking of, next we have a yellow No ID Mini Phalaenopsis. Um, and the main reason I got this was this absolutely stunning lip. It's just contrast with yellow amazingly it's unbelievable and again it's got a lovely little white nose neither of these little mini fowls have any fragrance but i absolutely love them i feel like they just bring such joy to the hobby because they're so easy to grow they're so easy to care for they don't take up that much room next we've got a phalaenopsis chileriana and i should say i got this in bud already this is my final Elsner orchidine uh, haul. So I got this one with a spike and it had a few mealy bugs which we dealt with. I reposted it into semi-hydro and the buds are doing just fine and they've opened. I can't detect any fragrance at all unfortunately. Um, this could be because it's one of the more kind of line bred Phalaenopsis chilerianas. The ones that are less kind of line bred are apparently ones that have more barring patterns on the leaves and have a stronger fragrance. I'm not 100% sure if that's true or not, but mine certainly doesn't seem to have much of a fragrance at all. It is a beautiful flower though, and I feel like for a beginner getting into Phalaenopsis species, the Schleriana is a really beautiful addition because it's got wonderful foliage. It's got very similar care requirements to the more complex hybrid fowls. It's not a fussy one at all, and it's just a beautiful flower and this gorgeous kind of interesting bow shape on the lip, which I love. Looks like it's wearing a little bow tie and beautiful, beautiful mottled leaves. So that is the Phalaenopsis chileriana. Maybe we'll get a fragrance on the next bloom when I bloom it myself, you never know. Next, we've got the Cattleya Intermedia or Lata variety Rio. I got this one in a Classen Orchids haul last summer. It is actually blooming on the growth it produced for me in the summer. So it took a while, the sheath dried, and then some buds started forming. So it's an absolutely huge flower, not too much of a detectable fragrance, 
slight kind of mild honeyish fragrance it reminds me of but it won't fill the whole grow room it's not gonna um, be overpowering for anyone who's fragrance sensitive what I do love about it is the beautiful beautiful flaring on the lip it's just really really majestic kind of a showstopper and the flower is absolutely huge waxy and glossy um, so it's a real beauty to have in your collection. As you can see, the flower is actually nearly the size of the whole plant. It's quite a compact grower, although mine's kind of tilting over where the seedling back bulbs don't have any roots. Uh, it's just anchored by roots on the newest growths. So it had quite a good root system when it went into semi-hydro. Many of them survived, but several did die off. So at some point I'm going to unpot this and remove the old dead roots. For now, we're going to enjoy its beautiful, beautiful blooms. So that is a Cattleya Intermedia or Lata variety Rio. And it does have some gorgeous speckling on the pink flower as well. It's kind of a lavender shade of pink. So it's not particularly striking in that. What's really striking about it is the lip and the size of the flower and also the waxy glossy nature. Next up, we have the Muma Catavola Francis Fox, formerly Ricara Francis Fox, which is a cross between a Brasio Cattleya and a Muma Sophila. And Muma Sophila are really interesting plants because I have a species one and they have these little tiny holes in the pseudobulbs that ants can kind of live in and deposit debris. And that acts as kind of fertilizer for the plant. So they have kind of a symbiotic relationship with ants. I can't find any kind of holes in the pseudobulbs of this one though. The pseudobulbs themselves resemble brassavolas quite strongly. What's really interesting about this is the flower. And unfortunately, this is the first blooming for this orchid and we are missing some petals. Um, we've got the sepals, but no petals. Mainly this orchid though is uh, striking for its lip. So we've still got that at least. And hopefully the next bud that will open this spike will have petals and sepals. The lip color reminds me of a sunset. It's absolutely beautiful. So, so striking. And that's really what you want to get this orchid for. Bonus, it's quite easy to grow and it has a wonderful fragrance. Now, unfortunately, I didn't think this orchid was fragrant. And for this video, I decided to do a kind of thorough check of the fragrance. So I took it out of the grow room, put it in a separate room and monitored the fragrance. And it's fragrant at night time. So it obviously takes off after the Brassavola parent. It's fragrant mainly Obviously, I hadn't checked it overnight, but it was very strong at about six o'clock in the morning. It spiked from a pseudobulb that I actually knocked the leaf off of, of course. Um, it looked like it was getting a little bit stuck, so I fiddled and removed the leaf. So it's basically shaming me for my <laughs> neglectful parenting. Um, but it has also produced a spike from another new growth. So hopefully we will get an even more impressive show from that new growth, which is this one here. You can see that it's got a spike starting on that one. We do also have another new growth, which may or may not spike. Most of the new growth so far have been um, unifoliate, but it has produced a couple of bifoliate growths, which are the smaller ones. The original bulbs are the kind of yellowing back bulbs. Um, so it's growing quite a lot for me. What I am considering doing is putting it into a mix with more ceramis in because I found that it it seems to require more moisture and I found this with the Mimosophila, um species that I have as well. They seem to want a little bit more moisture. They're getting a little bit caught up in the dry top layer. We do have some down into the pot and they're going all the way down out of the bottom of the self-watering pot and into the reservoir. And I just think it might do better with a slightly sort of smaller, finer, more moisture retentive mix. So I'm going to try that out at some point. Um, just because I want more roots getting down kind of further into the pot. I don't think the shape of the pot helps though. So we're going to change that at some point. Just going to give you some close-ups of the flower because this is probably one of my favourite flowers actually. Pretty much ever. As I said, I'm a sucker for orange, pink, yellow flowers. So that is the Moma Catavola Francis Fox. 
Next up, we have the Catacetum Orchid Glade Jack of Diamonds coming in with a second round of spikes. So this is the second spike on this orchid. It's bloomed for me before and I've shown you it in a What's in Bloom video a couple of months ago, I think. And it started another spike and it's got about, I think, the same amount of flowers as last time. Beautiful, huge, demonic flowers. Um, that's kind of how I would describe them. They're gorgeous, but kind of terrible looking as well. Uh, they do look like something from a sci-fi movie. Now, I've already accidentally um, bashed this one with a Dendrobium nobili coming upstairs. So I have triggered the pollen by accident on a few of the blooms. So I figured, what the hey, um, let's trigger some more pollen. So we're gonna um, press some pollen buttons and watch it eject its pollen. It's already been in bloom about a week and from experience it only lasted about two weeks last time and I'm not that big a fan of the fragrance. It smells kind of like a cross between mint toothpaste and you know the aniseed type toothpastes you can get which are fluoride free. Um, I have memories of them so it smells like a combination of those two. So I filmed a slow motion pollen ejection here, which is slightly bad quality because I kept missing the actual slow-mo uh, setting on my camera. But that is the pollen ejecting and the very sticky result of that. So I had to try that a couple of times because my camera kept playing up. But that is the Catacetum Orchid Glade Jack of Diamonds and some fairly poor slow motion filming of its pollen ejecting. Next, we have the Phalaenopsis Yafon Deep Coffee crossed with Zeng Min Turtle Dove. That's quite a mouthful. Um, I hope that they come up with a registered hybrid name for it soon. Produces this absolutely gorgeous yellow flower that hasn't faded. It's very waxy and it's almost got very um, kind of slight green hints in it, in the shading. That's not an artifact of the camera. You can actually see them in person also. Uh, it just seems to come up more on camera. So it's this beautiful glossy waxy greenish yellow with a little white nose and a very slightly fuzzy lip currently got three spikes on it obviously you can see one spike is performing better than the other spike at this point in terms of buds and we do have a third spike hidden under a leaf which will uh, not be very visible at all it's got this really really stunning fragrance which is like a very lemony kind of citrus floral fragrance i really enjoy it i actually find it stronger than the phalaenopsis leodoro so i'm just going to show you its little hidden spike as well here it's a very vigorous grower. I got this one from an orchid garden haul, uh, which was one of the first proper big hauls I filmed, I think, at the sort of mid last year, maybe summer last year. And it came with a couple of um, spikes which didn't progress any further. It's since formed these as new spikes. And it's actually a really big plant. I've put it in this hanging pot so it can kind of drape down in my little orchid wardrobe, kept in quite bright light. It seems to really enjoy these conditions and it's produced quite a few new roots in semi-hydro setup so it seems to be adapting very very well. I've got a few more buds even on the way on the spikes and so that is the Phalaenopsis Yafon Deep Coffee crossed with Zeng Min Turtle Dub and there is a very similar hybrid called I think Fal uh, Yafon Christmas. If you're in America that hybrid is much easier to get hold of than this one so definitely look into that if you're interested in getting this kind of similar display. They have very similar parents so I really really recommend this hybrid if you can get hold of it. Next up, we have the Angrecum dideri crossed with Neophenicia falcata, but really? Um, so, this is a bit of a controversial hybrid. Since my suspicions about this, I've been looking into it on different orchid forums, and it actually turns out that most people that have got this hybrid from different nurseries, both Elsner and Schwerter in Europe, have a similar form that basically resembles the Angrecum dideri, but none of them have flowered yet. So people have kind of been a bit um, on edge about what it's actually gonna look like. And I can tell you, it looks exactly like an Angrecum dideri and probably is an Angrecum dideri. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that the um, hybrids are being missold, what it could be is a failed pollination attempt which then has resulted in parthenogenesis which is a form of self-pollination. So the hybridizers could truly believe that they have successfully crossed the Neophenicia with the Angrecum um, or we could all have just been sold a uh, 
flask of Anglicum dideri seedlings. Anyway, I will contact Schwerter with a picture just to show them. Um, I'm not sure that they'll be overly interested since they're just selling the hybrid that they've been told it is. But I've got what appears to be an Agricum de Deary. I very much doubt that there is any successful near Phoenicia uh, influence in this. Anyway, I'm going to generalize this as an Agricum de Deary. So it's got an absolutely huge flower in proportion to the size of the cute little plant. It's got the fuzziest, knobbliest little roots, which I absolutely love. And the fragrance on this flower is absolutely beautiful. It reminds me of very sweet jasmine. And I'm actually not a fan of a jasmine fragrance. It can be very strong and overpowering. Um, but this is a very beautiful, sweet fragrance with just kind of hints of jasmine. And it's fragrant in kind of evening, nighttime and daytime from what I can tell seems to be stronger in the evening so that is whatever it is and Grecum de Deary I guess either way absolutely beautiful orchid next up we've got my dendrobium nobly type hybrids so these can refer to any number of dendrobium hybrids that have kind of nobly types in their parentage nobly is a species so i don't want to get these confused with the species nobly they can have lots and lots of other parents in them and they vary quite significantly i think in their um, care and the degree to which they require a winter rest to flower. So I haven't given any of my Dendrobium nobly types, cane types, a winter rest at all this year. They're in semi-hydro and I've kept watering and fertilizing as normal. And this is the result. The spring dream has flowered profusely off every available node that it has. The two older canes that it produced last year, plus a couple of nodes that were available from the previous canes in addition to this. The canes are huge. The reason that I kind of kept watering and fertilizing was because I had one cane that was um, produced later in the year last year. It produced two last year. And I wanted to make sure that it continued to grow to its full potential. And then I just kind of kept going with it because I was already like, well, they're probably not going to bloom. I've been fertilizing and watering too long and I don't treat them any differently if I'm doing it to one of my dendrobium nobly types because they live in the same location then I'm going to water the other one with the same kind of mix and it's just the way I kind of care for my orchids I try to keep them the same and then I can kind of observe differences to be honest that are between individuals better and the Comet King Akatsuki I believe that this uh, variety is has actually uh, only flowered with a couple of buds whereas the Spring Dream has flowered with loads so Potentially the Comet King needs a little bit more of a drier rest in my care. Um, maybe not, maybe it's just the maturity of the plant thing. I'm going to measure the cane on the Spring Dream at some point, just to show you kind of the size that they can get, because they can get very big. The Spring Dream has no detectable fragrance, whereas the Comet King has a lovely sweet fragrance of hyacinths. You can see that it's flowered from kind of the oldest canes that it has, the more leafless canes. Um, whereas the leaf canes haven't produced any buds really except for this little one here. So we've got sort of four canes on this orchid that are producing buds, but it's hardly a spectacular show like the Spring Dream has put on. So I think maybe next year I'm going to try um, giving these a rest and seeing how they do. Although maybe not the Spring Dream because I've had a really successful year with it this year um, with that care. So they clearly differ hugely in their requirements is really the point that I wanted to make um, and how much of a rest they need. The Spring Dream flowers this year are actually much bigger than they have been for me previously. It was out of season for a while so this is actually the first flowering that I've got myself from it. Uh, I got it a couple of years ago but it just took a while to adjust back into a normal kind of seasonal cycle. They often can because they're forced to bloom at inappropriate times in garden centres. Now, one thing I would say is these can get extremely, extremely huge. So my spring dream, the latest cane is currently at around 56 centimeters or 22 inches in length. You've got to have space for these guys to uh, continue to grow because they can get very big. Although I'm not sure if this is something um, between the two varieties that I've got, but the Comet King does seem more compact than the spring dream. 
As I mentioned, they are both in semi-hydroponics, and I'm just going to show you the root system quickly. I've seen a couple of people asking on forums recently uh, if nobly types can work in semi-hydro. In my conditions, they can, and they're not even too fussed by the dry top layer in my conditions. As I said, I haven't stopped watering, um, but you can quite easily winter rest things in semi-hydro or self-watering. Just don't keep the reservoir full. So those are my nobly type hybrids. Next up, we have an orchid that I got labelled as a Borogiara Lazio, which is from Inca Orchids. Since Borogiara are now on Sodopsis, I'm assuming that's the new classification, but I actually can't find this as a registered hybrid name, so I couldn't track down its parentage. Um, I'm not sure if it's now just a commercial name registered by Inca as like a something they can sell it under rather than actually like an RHS registered hybrid name. I can't find it on orchid roots or in the RHS registry. So if you guys um, know the parentage or could link me to it, if you know it, that would be amazing. But I can't seem to track down the uh, hybrid details. Anyway, uh, this is uh, Inca orchids, Oncidium type, which they label as Lazio. It's got a beautiful soft floral uh, vanilla -y fragrance and this one this year has produced nine spikes for me i recently repotted it i say recently it was back in october or something like that november and um, i'll link the video down in the description but this one is now in a mixture of pumice lecca and synthic and seems to be enjoying it it hasn't skipped a beat from transitioning to self-watering with sphagnum to this mix as you can see and um, so it's produced nine spikes for me which is the most it's ever produced so far I think this is just to do with the maturity of the plant rather than the media switch though because it would have already been primed for making spikes when I switched it. It just hadn't got to that stage yet. Um, but it obviously wasn't too distressed by the media change. It's quite a display and it's absolutely wonderful. Oncidium types can be so rewarding when they produce this type of display, uh, particularly if they are fragrant like this is. So it kind of fills the whole grow room with this beautiful sweet floral fragrance. I care for it in the same way as my other Oncidium types. So it's now in self-watering or semi-hydro, um, but with a mix of Lekka, Synthic and Pumice. So it's constantly moist, um, yet hopefully airy, and it seems to have transitioned really well to this mix. I absolutely adore the display on this orchid, and I love the colour. It's like a rusty reddish brown. It's very kind of autumnal, there's a little bit of variation if you look up the Lazio online. I quite like mine. It's got um, the odd little freckle of white on the lip, but mostly a solid colour. Some fringing of white around the petals and sepals that just make it a little bit more interesting and give it a bit of dimension. And then the beautiful kind of flaring on the lip that kind of hints maybe at its parentage. Maybe there's some Miltonia in there. I'm not sure. Um, I would love to know the hybrid details actually and see if it's at all related to the Sotoanum because I wonder if that's where it's get the, getting the kind of sugary vanilla -y hint to the floral nature. I'm just going to show you kind of the individual spikes. So the pseudobulbs that have flowered have two to three spikes per pseudobulb and that's across a couple of pseudobulbs and then there are a couple that just have one odd spike um, to make up the nine. Now I'm trying to, I've tried counting these individually to show you guys and it just kind of gets a little bit confusing I'm trying to count them all as I rotate the plant um, but I've counted nine so that's how many it has. Some of them are branching now as well. Now the flowers last about three weeks or so um, so some of the original flowers when they first started have already faded as the branches are kind of going along and we've still got a couple of spikes which are just starting or will be maturing soon just in there um, so should have quite the display continuing for quite some time as these continue to branch out and make more spikes seems to have well and truly hit its blooming stride. I can't imagine getting much better than nine spikes from a non sodium type, but um, we'll, we'll try and improve on this. I don't know if it's going to happen. So that is the, I guess, on Sodopsis, Lazio. Let me know if anyone has any more detail on this hybrid. I believe it's possibly just an Inca Orchids trade name, but I'd be interested to find out more. And that is the end of my What's in Bloom for January video. 
If you're still here, then I really, really appreciate you watching till the end and I hope it's been interesting and not just a really long, boring video. Let me know any comments or feedback down below and I will see you guys later. Bye. Thank you.